Hello, and welcome to the SharePoint Framework and JavaScript Special Interest Group Bi-Weekly Sync, or Bi-Weekly Meeting. It is April 12th, 2018. I just wanted to apologize for missing the last one of these calls. I had taken a red-eye flight, but I want to thank Vesa and the rest of the team for covering for me, so very much appreciated uh, on my end there. Jumping in, uh, we'll talk about always, uh, start with uh, what's the purpose of these calls, why do we do these calls, so this is part of the larger SharePoint Patterns and Practices program. And the reason we started these special interest group calls, uh, this was the first, and we now have one as well for the PowerShell and uh, CSOM libraries, was that we just had uh, grown too much to be able to cover what we wanted to cover uh, in our single monthly calls. Um, and that's kind of almost happening again now. We'll have to have special interest, group, special interest groups. But... Uh, so the purpose of this call is to really talk about all things client-side development uh, related to SharePoint. Uh, so that's very much the SharePoint framework, uh, but as well other client-side development patterns, whether they be script editor, uh, some of the other techniques folks can use and leverage. And then as well, we talk about the PNPJS libraries uh, that we've worked together to create as a community and build those things up. Uh, so we talk about both those topics, and a big part of what we do are demos from all of you out there in the community, which I've said it before, and I'll continue to say it, I think uh, is very much uh, one of the more valuable parts of these calls, other than the, the news and updates, but seeing what folks out there in the community have done, uh, I think really uh, helps me. I, it's really exciting to see and learn from what everybody else is doing. So great stuff, and we've got uh, three great demos uh, on the call for you today, which we'll talk about in just a second. Before we get there, uh, two quick links. Uh, the SPPNP-Community takes you to the Microsoft Tech Community uh, SharePoint uh, area or channel or however we're, we're labeling that. But uh, it's a great place for general questions. Uh, if you have uh, some topics around SharePoint development, whether it's SharePoint Framework or any of the, the, the other SharePoint development models that aren't uh, necessarily specific issues against a certain library or against SharePoint Framework, that's a great general discussion forum. So your design questions, how would I, you know, design this certain web part or this application, uh, that's a great place to get those questions answered. And the second link, sp-devdocs, uh, takes you to uh, the, develop the documentation for all SharePoint development. So not just SharePoint Framework, but all of the SharePoint development documentation is going there. And so definitely that's a great link to check out, uh, especially if you're just starting in SharePoint Framework and want to see uh, you know, how to get started. Uh, wonderful tutorials that really take you from uh, 0 to 60 very quickly um, and you know, get you uh, develop the environment built up, uh, create your first web part, create your first extension. Um, really uh, easy to get into and uh, see what's going on there. So I encourage you to check out both of those areas. And for today's agenda, we'll have the uh, engineering update on SharePoint Framework uh, from VESA. Then we've got updates on the PNPJS libraries, the CLI, as well as the reusable client controls. And then we'll have a demo from Elio on some of the new uh, reusable client controls uh, uh, today on the call. And then our two main community demos are first from Bob, uh, the classic versus modern experience in relation to the footer. And then as well from David Warner, uh, SPFX extensions and dynamic properties. So that's coming back to uh, how to sort of configure things a little more dynamically uh, than um, uh, sort of having your static properties at uh, uh, deployment time uh, locked in. And then maybe a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. We shall see. Uh, before we get uh, to all of that, I want to remind folks of the ways to participate both in uh, the SharePoint uh, Patterns and Practices and this call. Uh, one of the main ways we love to see folks participate is demoing uh, on the calls. So whether it's a SharePoint Framework solution, whether it's a, a PMPJS project, whether it is none of those things, maybe some you know really cool thing you've done in a script editor web part or, or you know some of the other techniques, um, really like to see those demos. If you would like to do a demo, number one, we very much want you to do that. 
just reach out to us, um, let us know, and we'll do our best to get you on the schedule as quickly as possible. Like, so we can't always get you on maybe the very next call, but we'll get you on the, the call after that, um, you know, and make sure you get to do your demo. So very much uh, encourage all of you to reach out if you've done something cool and want to show it off. This is a great forum to do so. As well, you can always contribute on GitHub. Uh, so through issues, uh, through uh, contributing pull requests, or just uh, in that last uh, block there, just providing general feedback on all of the things we do. So feedback on these calls, feedback on the libraries, feedback on SharePoint Framework. All of that feedback is really valuable and really taken to heart by us, and we encourage you to give us that feedback on everything we're doing so that we can make things better uh, for everybody. Uh, so we can't always act on every piece of feedback immediately, but we do value all that feedback. And, you know, the core team, the, the Patterns and Practices core team, definitely discusses all your feedback um, and does our best to, uh, you know, sort of adapt and change and evolve and grow uh, what we're doing based on what we hear from folks. So I'll hand things over at this point to Vesa for an update on the SharePoint framework. Excellent. So let me actually take over this as a presenter. Uh, so a few slides. Uh, I don't have actually that much uh, new or excitement uh, because we did have a community call actually on Tuesday, the monthly community call, and this is the bi-weekly special interest group call for SharePoint Framework. So nothing really super, super exciting in here, but I wanted to pinpoint again a few slides and a few things and remind some resources. Uh, and obviously uh, the community pages, this is new, relatively new stuff uh, which went live just just before the last community call, SharePoint Framework community call. So if you're looking into how do I contribute, uh, what are the community calls, how, uh, what are the open source resources available around SharePoint development or SharePoint Framework, samples and other whatever location, AKMS, SP, PMP, that will be redirecting you to the new uh, community pages and pretty soon the old pages will be redirected here as well. So here you can find the, the descriptions for the repositories and all the other stuff uh, which is relevant for you. And if there's typos, if there's uh, missing information, you can actually contribute. So you can always click edit and uh, submit a pull request uh, for these pages as well. Now, the second thing, uh, a reminder, 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 please, 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 um, uh, well, not please, please, please on this one, but uh, if you're looking into SharePoint dev documentation, uh, AKMS SP dev docs or docs.microsoft.com slash SharePoint, uh, you can find the official platform for uh, all the relevant uh, SharePoint documentation. Oh, and including SharePoint Framework and other SharePoint development uh, areas. We are improving this on a daily basis. Uh, so we are introducing new capabilities, new content here almost on a daily basis. And also already today, if you do any comments on these pages, those will be generated as issues to our SP DevDocs issue list, uh, which will mean that we can have an easy communication channel for you through the GitHub uh, source. Now, the issue list kind of mentioned as well. So all of the comments in the in the SP Dev Docs uh, will be generated in the, our SP Dev Docs issue list. But this is also an issue list for you to take granted if you find a an issue in the bug uh, in the APIs. Let's say some CSM API doesn't work, some SPFX API doesn't work. Uh, you run into random issue within the SharePoint development, um, and you. you potentially have called to SharePoint Online support, and then SharePoint Online support is saying, well, we don't support customization because we don't know how to support them. This is the location where you can actually get help. Uh, we triage this multiple times in a week, um, and then we uh, prioritize the incoming issues uh, based on the criticalness of them, and then we assign our engineering, uh, engineering uh, resources on them. Obviously, we need to also prioritize new feature development, but uh, some of the same guys are assisting on a critical things uh, found from here. Uh, as an example, just a small uh, update on certain things. So uh, the eventing uh, challenge, what we have, uh, see consulting term, not an issue, a challenge. Well, it is an issue. So um, the eventing, eventing uh, issue related on dates transitions in SharePoint framework, we did have already a fix for it internally. Now we're trying to figure out or, or do the final testing on that one before we push it out uh, as a new version uh, in the SharePoint online. So that is finally, finally getting uh, proper traction and it is uh, the high priority thing on our agenda to get uh, fixed. Now, uh, 
a few more uh, assets getting started with SharePoint Framework tutorials. So just, there's always new people obviously arriving on SharePoint Framework and realizing that this is the direction where we are heading um, because the, the, well, you probably should not really prioritize SharePoint adding model development in SharePoint Online anymore. SharePoint Framework is the de facto model and we are going to actually grow this to be even bigger than SharePoint. So we're looking into uh, using the similar models with other services as well, which is pretty cool. More on that one in SPC. Uh, small teasers, um, obviously in here. But AKMS SPFX tutorials, or you go to the docs.microsoft.com uh, dev platform, um, and you can find the tutorials and links to the videos, which are also showing how the tutorial works, uh, which is great. Now, uh, on that usage, um, I've been promising to keep updating on this one. This, again, this does not have any numbers. Most likely, we will explain some numbers in SBC, uh, SBC being the SharePoint conference in Las Vegas on the 21st of May. Um, but this is showing you the growth curve on adaption and usage, actual usage of SharePoint framework in SharePoint Online. I'm not going to go to the details of how do we calculate this and how do we actually do that, but this shows you the, the uh, growth traction, um, which is uh, pretty interesting. So we're way, 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 way past uh, SharePoint adding model usage uh, with SharePoint Framework, and, the, and it just keeps on growing uh, quite fast uh, still, which is really, really great. Now, uh, roadmap update. Uh, I went through this one uh, already on Tuesday as well. Uh, this week is, is this when we have the monthly community call, those weeks are pretty hectic uh, because then we have two calls. Um, but uh, quick updates on this one potentially. So a uh, few things to notice. We released a new set of site actions, site design action or site script actions earlier this week uh, on Tuesday. And that included, for example, install an SPFX solution to the site. So now you're able to all automate uh, using the site design and site script capability installation of the SharePoint framework solution to the newly created site. So whenever an end user creates a new site collection, uh, your SPFX solution can be installed automatically to the site. You don't necessarily need to have any PowerShell or admin operations or automation or anything running in Azure, and that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, there's a lot of ad additional also site design actions which were released on Tuesday. So uh, if you go to dev.office.com slash blocks, you can actually find a list of things, what are the actions which were included, and those are obviously documented in the uh, official documentation as well. Groupify API, and we're right now working on, on documenting that one. Uh, so it is coming out during Q2. We're looking into getting it out uh, potentially before SharePoint conference. Uh, so you can actually start uh, previewing the Groupify API, and then there will be new branding options and a lot of unknowns, which we cannot yet talk about uh, in SharePoint conference, which is within slightly more than a month ago or a month from here. Now, that's all about what I have from SharePoint Framework side. So no cool demos uh, for this time. Uh, we do have cool demos coming up from uh, David and Elio and Bob. So uh, let's actually move on uh, in the in the topics. So Patrick, BMPJS, take it away. And I'll check if <coughs> I missed any questions on the Iron Window uh, while Patrick is going forward. Yep, so uh, some updates on the uh, client-side libraries. We released uh, 104 on April 6th. That was last Friday. Uh, still working on CDNJS support. Like I said uh, before, that's all been approved on their end. It's just a matter of their folks who are super, super busy uh, getting a chance to merge uh, that stuff into the repo. So still working on that. We'll update folks when we get there. Uh, we're doing, we've been doing weekly beta releases on Fridays. Uh, so that's, uh, we're going to try and hold to that rhythm. I think it's nice to have a, a schedule for those and gives folks a chance to try things out maybe when they come in uh, back to work on Monday or, uh, you know, Friday afternoon, depending on your time zones. And then uh, do keep an eye. We, uh, we across all of patterns and practices have made a commitment uh, to, to maintain change log files for each of our repositories. And so we're doing that uh very tightly for the PNP JS libraries. And so that's uh, really the uh, source of information for what's updated, what's changed uh, with each release. And I've got a sample of that 
uh, over on the side there. That's that image. And so the way to read these is there'll be a version number uh, with the release date as kind of a heading. And then you'll have different sections for added, fixed, or changed. And so this is just uh, a sample of some of the stuff that was added in the 104 release. So uh, some really good stuff. Some of it uh, major, some of it a little minor or more minor, but... Uh, uh, that's that's the that's the uh, way to keep track of what's changing. So we're doing away. I used to do blog posts for each release and stuff like that. Um, and I think this is a little clearer, and it's right there in the repository. Um, so uh, I think that'll help uh, everybody find everything. And as well, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I link to each pull request for each change. So if you uh, say uh, you try and use the Adel client, you could go look at that pull request to see what's changed, or maybe uh, it might help you debug a problem and report an issue. Uh, if you see some some problems with something new. So check out the change log. Um, I've been really uh, happy with how that's working, and I think it's uh, a nice way to communicate what's going on. Uh, in terms of roadmap, uh, we work on the issues for each release or each uh, beta for the issues that are coming in the issues list. As always, if you find anything, please just report it to us. Uh, please do include enough detail. Uh, we can uh, you know, figure out what's going on and as well uh, kind of keep an eye on your issue in case we have some follow-up questions. But we'll do our best to, to either answer your question or fix uh, whatever you might have found. As well, I want to encourage folks, if you have ideas on uh, ways to enhance or grow the library, please uh, let us know. Don't uh, keep those to yourself. We really uh, value that feedback, as I said earlier, and, and use that to help develop our roadmap. And as well, I'll just tease a little bit. We've got uh, some nice surprises I think we're working on uh, that I think will come out uh, for the community that I think will be pretty cool. Uh, but we're going to keep those under wraps a little bit just because uh, I like to surprise people. And then, uh, so links there, the PNPJS, that first link will take you to the documentation uh, for the PNPJS libraries. You can follow the hashtag PNPJS on Twitter. And as well, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. It's been a while since I put uh, my handle up here. So I'm at Mediocre Bowler. So you can find me on Twitter. Um, and I'll generally uh, announce each of the beta releases as well as major releases and uh, that sort of stuff uh, on the Twitter. Um, so check that out. And then I did want to, it is April, so I wanted to kind of update folks on the March numbers and what we're seeing. So continue to see phenomenal growth, uh, for which I'll always say thank you to everybody out there in the community, um, because you all drive uh, that growth by using the libraries in your projects. Uh, we're up to 1.6 billion requests going through the library uh, in the month of March, and we're into 3,000 plus tenants uh, for the month of March, which is phenomenal. Um, really excited to see that. And I just, again, can't say thank you enough um, for being on the journey with us and choosing to use our work in your projects, uh, which really makes it uh, viable and live. Um, so excited to see that. And the chart at the bottom, I think, is interesting uh, because uh, so what the chart at the bottom is, is the usage for the new library. So this is filtered out to be just the at PNP scoped uh, libraries. And so you'll see we, we had n no usage in January. Uh, 95, uh, 95 requests went through the library in uh, uh, the month of February, but we're up to 7 million in March. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but uh, for those of you that were here uh, at the beginning when we first started the SPP and PJS library, uh, this is a similar growth curve uh, to what we saw then. So we started off obviously with nothing, um, but then we kind of went to 7 million, and then I think it was 14 million or 16, something like that. Um, so excited to see folks starting to migrate to the at PNP JS libraries, and would encourage you as you have a chance, um, do start to migrate. July will be the last release of SPP and PJS. So that library will, will not go away. We're not going to delete anything or take it off of NPM or anything crazy like that. But uh, we're going to stop uh, really uh, growing it and adding to it and improving it and be focused on the new library. So we have a transition guide out there. Check that out. If you have questions that aren't answered in the transition guide, please let us know so we can get that updated and help folks out. Uh, so some updates now on the Office 365 CLI. Uh, there's a new beta, 1.2.0 out. 
<coughs> excuse me, I've got my spring allergies, so uh, you get my allergy voice today. And we've got a whole suite of uh, new commands that have come out for the CLI in that beta um, or since we last talked. Uh, I'm not going to read all of them, uh, but you can check out. They have a change log, uh, of course, as well for that project. Uh, check that out. Uh, great new additions in there, and a lot of those are coming from folks in the community. So if you're looking for ways to contribute and you're interested in the Office 365 CLI, Waldeck has put, uh, there's a bunch of uh, issues already there, so you can go grab an issue um, and add a command. Um, it's it's uh, not, uh, each command isn't terribly difficult, and they're fairly atomic. So you can work on a command um, and get that added, and uh, it's great to see the community involvement continue to grow uh, for the Office 365 CLI. Uh, you can install it directly from NPM, and you can watch uh, or check out the tutorials on that. Excuse me. And then uh, down there in the corner, uh, Waldeck is following Office 365 CLI on Twitter. There's a Gitter channel as well. And then you can check out the Office 365 CLI docs at aka.ms. 0365 CLI. Um, so those docs will get you uh, started, again, from uh, having never used it before to being effective and using it as a great tool uh, to help manage uh, your tenant. And just a reminder, please do try to stay on mute uh, when possible. So we got a quick update as well on the reusable components. So uh, we just had a release of 125. Uh, for the React controls with fixes for the uh, list, uh, list view item selection uh, after the array updates undoing that selection. That was uh, issue number 55 has been fixed. And then as well, the property controls, 150, have had several great enhancements around the property field, list picker, the term picker, and as well the term store picker service. Um, uh, so great improvements there, again, driven by great uh, feedback from folks out there in the community. And now we have Elio on the call, who's do, going to do a demo uh, quickly of some of the new stuff uh, with those controls. So Elio, if you're ready. Yes, I'm ready. I will share my screen. So tell me when you see it. Got loading on my side. And I've got it. Okay. okay. Perfect. So we had some great contributions last week uh, to the field list picker and to the term picker. So what has been added? Uh, last week, uh, Chris Kent has added the new um, availability of the select all and deselect all capability of the list picker. So now you can select all lists at once. And also for the term picker, it's now aligned to what SharePoint out of the box is offering in uh, lists and libraries. So before with the term picker, you had to click on the tag and then you could select in the tree view the term you were interested in and save it and it will be selected for you. But now, as of um, the latest release for 1.5.0, you can also type. And it will also find the terms. And from the moment you press Enter, it will select the terms. And normally, if everything should go all right, it's selected in the, in the term view or in the tree view. So great additions. Uh, Great contributions from uh, the community, from uh, David and Alex and Chris. So thank you. That was it on my side. So great, thank you, uh, Elio. Awesome uh, to see that, and great stuff as as always from the community. So great work. Uh, really appreciate uh, those contributions. Um, one of these days, I'll get better at clicking through. Uh, Skype to share things. So I believe the next presenter up is going to be uh, Bob uh, German. So if, uh, Bob is ready. So we've got, whoops, excuse me for a second. We're not at a Q&A. So if Bob's ready, we've got classic versus modern experiences with the footer. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yep, sure can. Yeah, let me know when you can see the screen. Actually, there's more than a footer. There's also a header. They kind of go together, I guess, right? Um Hey, maybe you're seeing it now. Uh, no, I got it still loading on my side. OK. 
Okay. And I got it. Great. So what you should see is on the left a classic publishing site and on the right a modern site. So I work with, uh, in my job, I'm back at Microsoft now, really thrilled about that. Uh, my job is in one commercial partner, so I work with um, managed partners in the U.S. to help make them successful. This one partner is doing a huge migration of a big multinational company, and they want to go modern as much as they can, but they still need classic publishing pages for some scenarios. So the challenge that they threw to me was how can we build, um, and they had already built a SharePoint framework extension for menus and footers, um, I actually made much simpler ones here. So you can see here's my little menu up at the top, and this all works fine. If your needs are simple, you can just take this as it is. If your needs are complex, you can use it as a starter. And then down here on the footer are some links and a compliance message. Um, and now here's the same thing in Classic. So this was their goal was 100% common code. They wanted to reuse the work they had done in the SharePoint framework over on the classic side. And that's really the, uh, that was really the goal of the sample, which is now up on the PNP extension samples. So, um, here I have a little tool that I like to use called Beyond Compare. It compares whole hierarchies of files. And you can see here on the left again is the classic code and on the right is the uh, modern code. I actually could have arranged this so that the common folder was uh, outside of the two folders and, you know, kind of they both reference the same physical files. But for whatever reason, I decided to make a copy of it. But you can see here in Beyond Compare that the vast majority of the solution is common. Um, all of my React components, my localization strings, uh, my data model, and my um, service that reaches out and gets the data are all 100% common code. The only thing that's separate is the actual application customizer file and the, um, uh, the a little thing called the language manager. So I'll dig into those uh, into those right now. So let's just take a look at the code. So here's the this is the repo or this is the the contribution, which is up in the repo right now. And if you look at the, uh, if we start off by looking in the SharePoint framework side, it should look pretty familiar like a SharePoint framework extension. Um, and if I go into my actual customizer code, and let's see, I haven't done an NPM install since I moved it over to the new repo, so that's why uh, you're seeing some some red lines, but basically it's just an application customizer, and what it's doing is it's reading in a JSON file from um, from my tenant that has all the headers, the menus, and the footers, and all that stuff, and then when it gets that, it's uh, calling out to something. Uh, it's grabbing the placeholder content, and then it's calling this thing called the component manager on line 55, which actually renders the uh, the React side. So I moved all the React out of this file where the Yeoman template would have normally put it and put it all in common. And if we go up to the classic version, uh, this is slightly more interesting over there. I have a class called boot header footer, which does something kind of similar, but what it does but it does it without the assistance of the SharePoint framework because obviously we're in a classic site. There is no SharePoint framework. So what it's going to do is make the elements for the header and footer, um, and then it's going to go ahead and um, inject those onto the page uh, around a well-known uh, HTML element, and then it does the same thing of calling the uh, calling the same service using the same component manager to attach to those L HTML elements, and um, you know the rest of it is the same. And then there needs to be something to actually bootstrap it. So down here on line 43, you can see just a tiny bit of code that's actually going to start things running in the classic side. Um, and this old archaic uh, execute or delay until body. I bet you didn't think you'd see ASP.NET AJAX on a PNP call, but now you've now now we've seen everything, right? Um, and that goes ahead and uh, and just initializes the thing and bootstraps it. I had to put in this little is dialog check because otherwise it was actually going to put headers into the uh, into dialog boxes that showed up in the classic UI. One of the things that's kind of nice about this, by the way, I forgot to mention this. So let me go back. If I'm here on my classic site, um, I could easily find myself in modern mode, 
by just going, since I'm on SharePoint uh, framework, hey, look, I'm in a modern page, right? All I have to do is go into a list somewhere, and all of a sudden I'm in modern, right? So having this common header and footer actually is useful for that, too, because it gets rid of some of the jarring uh, experience of having things change when you switch between classic and uh, and modern, even within the same site. So uh, the other thing I guess I w would show here, and I don't, you can tell me how much time to take, uh, Patrick and company. Um, I could go into more detail, but um, the language, the multilingual handling was kind of interesting on this. So uh, this being a a multinational. Uh, customer at the end of the day. Um, one of the things that they wanted was uh, some kind of localization. And so I moved the loc file, this localization uh, folder, into common. And I have my little my strings. So it's just the footer message here. Again, this is just a proof of concept to show how to do things. So I didn't need to show 12 different strings. I just have one is enough to show the principle. And then here it is in English. And here it is in probably bad French, because I don't speak French very well. And, um, you know, and, and it works the same as normal in SharePoint Framework. But I wrapped the SharePoint Framework's uh, behavior in this little thing called the Language Manager, which just imports the strings from the, uh, the localized strings from SharePoint Framework, and then uh, spits them back out using get strings. So wherever I need strings in my code, instead of calling in the common code, instead of calling SharePoint Framework, I call this little language manager. Now, if we pop up to classic, you'll see that the language manager had to do a little bit more work in classic mode. Um, here it is. It's going to go ahead and uh, I'll bet you didn't see that. think you'd see this on a modern SharePoint call, right? Our old friend SP page context info, which as far as I know is the best way to get um, – to get an idea of what SharePoint thinks the language is so that this will always stay in sync with the rest of the page as users uh, change their profile or have different language preferences in their browsers. And then it's simply going to come in here and look at the UI culture and uh, require in those uh, the, the appropriate localization file and return that. So that's how, uh, how the localization is working. So everything else here is common, right? There's this little uh, component manager that actually handles the React binding. And so, again, apologies for not doing the NPM install in this copy of the repo, so you're getting the little uh, uh, errors looking, appearing to be there that aren't really there in uh, Visual Studio Code. But what it's going to do here is it's going to take DOM elements, which are sort of common to both classic and modern, and then it's going to go ahead and um, and render those with React DOM. And, you know, from there, everything is just kind of the same uh, underneath of that. Um, maybe one of the cool things I actually stole from somewhere, um, Tony Thomas um, had this great, had this CSS-only um, navigation menu, which I gave him some credit for here. The other kind of reference around this is Julie Turner did a great series of blog articles on um, how to conquer your uh, development tools or something like that, and I've got a pointer to all this in my blog, and it's also in the documentation here in the repo. So um, what she did was she just kind of gave step-by-step -step instructions on how to set up um, – how to set up uh, Webpack and TypeScript and all those familiar tools that we know and love in SharePoint Framework to use outside of the SharePoint Framework. So um, here's the article. It's Again, it's on my blog, and it's also here in the repo uh, that explains exactly how all this works in more detail than I'm going to take time for today. And um, this also has a pointer to Julie's uh, article. And so it was kind of nice to just basically use the same um, the same exact tools and um, and approach. Here, here's the here's a pointer to this article um, for both uh, classic and modern. So, if there are any questions, I'm glad to uh, 
to share, but I think that's about what I had to show. Now, Bob, let's actually do a few questions, uh, generic questions on the comments. So, Obas, there was a generic comment that, well, <coughs> SharePoint Framework should be doing this by default, which is a good feedback from Vincent. Uh, we could be potentially looking into doing this natively within a SharePoint Framework, which does require some resources, but it kind of would make sense because this is a quite classic scenario, especially for now, because you cannot hide the, the move to classic link in, in a SharePoint list and libraries, which I, I would have to say personally, I find it pretty uh, interesting that we don't have an option to hide that link uh, because then any time the end user can be suddenly falling the classic or falling the modern. So, and this is a great yeah. solution to then provide a consistent UI and experience for both sides. So absolutely. That's great. Well, thanks for saying that. I, it points out something I meant to mention, which is this exact scenario. If you look at the, you know, a lot of us are in, uh, in a mixed world of classic and modern. A lot of our customers are. Uh, web parts, SharePoint Framework handles quite beautifully in that if you have, you know, uh, Feature Pack 2 of SharePoint 2016, you can run it right on premises. You can run them in classic mode on, um, on SharePoint Online. The web parts are great, but what about the headers and the footers? You, I don't know if the actions and the field field renderers, field customizers make as much sense to try to common, but um, this is something that I think a lot of people are probably going to uh, need is a common footer and header for their yeah. site. Absolutely, because these are visible elements, and it's such a classic thing to embed a header or footer to the page using the JavaScript and embedding technique, which technically is SharePoint Framework. SharePoint Framework is actually embedding JavaScript on a page as well, but using the old classic user custom action model. Um, how did you associate the classic uh, uh, classic JavaScript output file? So you obviously have an output file, you have a bundled, uh, optimized, minified uh, bundle. How did you associate that then to be activated on the site? Just to go through that one as well. Yeah, so I, I have to confess that it's hard coded. So um, the so Julie has the code in her article on how to use uh, Gulp to push the bundle out to to classic to to a SharePoint library, and that's what I'm doing right now. I may at some point move it to CDN, um, but then I forgot to show this. So thanks for the prompt. Um, the installation is here. So um, this is our old friend PNP PowerShell, and um, so what it's going to do is it's actually um, going to inject PNP JavaScript links for the uh, for React, React DOM, and for the header footer. And you'll see wherever I have the little tenant, that means I cheated and hard-coded my URL. <laughs> and uh, the instructions actually have you go through, and, and there's like three places you have to go in and, and fix the code. Um, so it would be nice to get a little bit fancier about this, but right now it's hard coded in the installer. Yeah, uh, and this is absolutely fine. So, so because technically, um, um, David is actually commenting this one: custom actions for classic, then still very reasonable. So, um, and the answer is yes, absolutely, um, because that's precisely how SharePoint framework extensions actually work as well. Um, you actually add a user custom action. Uh, and then you associate that with the compo client component ID, the, the, um, the, the manifest which is in app catalog. So technically what Bob is doing here is just manually associating the JavaScript link to the user custom actions. Um, you could actually do this for uh, SharePoint framework extensions which have been deployed within your tenant using the tenant scoped option um, and kind of light them up uh, in the site level. So right. that's absolutely fine. Um, and I think actually David is going to talk about something related on these things uh, after this demo. So it's pretty cool. great. Cool. Yeah, the one thing that is common, the bundles are obviously different because there's different code in them as well. But the, um, the actual um, links that go out to the, so there's this little JSON file. Um, here's a sample that has all the links for the menus and builds all that out. That is actually common between the two, and I chose to put that in a SharePoint document library uh, in its own little site collection that could be permissioned appropriately. Uh, the idea being that the customer can go in and edit this file and update both the modern and classic menus at the same time. Absolutely makes sense. Cool stuff, and, and this is something which we uh, definitely need to think, how could we automate this more, uh, potentially in the future more efficiently uh, for customers making, because th there is majority of customers are still falling on this 
let's say, both modes uh, experience because it's really hard to make sure that your end users will not fall on classic in any scenario. So it's pretty obvious. This is great, great, great solution for avoiding confusion. But great, thanks. Um, looking into the timing, Patrick, uh, I think it's uh, we need to set, uh, give the turn for David. Uh, so we'll potentially have a few minutes time for Q&A in the end. Of yep. Time. No, great stuff from Bob. Awesome to see uh, that. And I know that's a challenge for a lot of folks straddling that world uh, as we as we all sit between classic and modern and and migrating folks. So it's a nice resource uh, there uh, to kind of see some techniques uh, to help with that. Um, and then, uh, David, if you're ready, you can just go ahead and take over uh, the presentation. Yep. Should be loading here momentarily. <laughs> Let me know when you guys can see. Order is absolutely uh, loading. fine. Yeah, and loading. Nice GIF animation. <laughs> All right, got you it. are on. Okay, great. So my name is David Warner. Uh, I work for Catapult Systems. Uh, there's my contact information, uh, work email, personal email, and Twitter handle. So feel free to reach out if you have questions. Um, a couple weeks ago, and this is a great add-on to Bob's demo, is is that uh, Waldick and Vesa were talking about deploying extensions, and uh, Waldick had kind of quizzed the group around why you would not deploy your feature framework custom action at the time and within your package, right? So why would you not include that? And it was because there is an opportunity where you can provide properties um, to uh, set the extension to do something different uh, in each time you set up the custom action. So that's what I want to do as a demo today. It's going to be a simple, a very simple implementation, uh, but a very powerful concept. So hopefully everybody can kind of see where we can go from uh, the demo with with uh, overriding the extension in terms of properties. So the first thing I'll do is show you, I'd already created a couple of extensions. I've pre-installed them, uh, right, because we all know that takes a little time. So I've already installed the app package. I'm here in a uh, site collection SPFX extensions base header 01. Um, and so I've already installed, already installed it on my site. Uh, I will show you what the code looks like. It is very simple. Um, but what it doesn't include here is here's the original JSON package solution, right? And we typically get uh, the features created here for us when we create the extension, which includes a, a generic name, uh, the ID, et cetera. And it references our feature framework, which is uh, creating the actual action. Right, hey, so that comes in framework, here. Feature framework, yay! <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. And, uh, <laughs> so we see the location. It's it's identifying the client component ID and the properties, uh, and it gets created for us. But we may not want that because we may be able to set up our extension to do something a little more unique than just uh, be a base extension. Uh, so in this case, uh, we'll come back to our our. Uh, Slides here, we'll pretend we're Cameron. We got a request to create a header with two columns. Fantastic, so we go ahead and do that. Uh, we see right here, I've just hard coded, again, simple implementation. I've done nothing more than hard code um, a, uh, a, a responsive, uh, I guess you could say three column. I've got my logo, and then I've got two columns for content. We see their header section 01, header section 02. But when this gets deployed, uh, because there is a lack of feature framework that actually uh, deploys the, the custom action, nothing happens. So what we're looking at here is the actual extension has been installed. Uh, it is loaded on the site. Uh, but if I refresh, uh, nothing shows up, right? And that's simply because the custom action doesn't exist. Uh, now, we may deploy that custom action manually. We may deploy it through, uh, I don't know, maybe site design, site scripts, right? Plug, plug. Um, because those could provision through PowerShell. So that's what we're going to use today to create these custom actions. So if I go over to my PowerShell, um, I've already connected to my tenant, and we're using PNP PowerShell to do this. Uh, so I've already connected to this particular site, and I'll just do a quick custom action. Uh, we can see it right down here. I'll, I'll run it, and we'll see that nothing gets returned. I've got no custom actions created. But if we use our add PNP custom action, uh, I'll just zoom in there so you can see what we're doing is we're creating a, a custom action and we're identifying the client side component ID of my extension. I'm giving it a name, a location, which is the application customizer, and I'm just scoping it to the web, right? And so what this will do uh, is it will essentially activate my app package and my extension that's already been installed in the site. Uh, you'll notice, though, that no properties are there. So it's simply just going to... 
uh, deploy it as is. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. We see it successfully ran. If I do a git pnp custom action again, uh, we can see it's now there. So if I go over and refresh the screen, what we're going to find is we'll now see my custom action has been loaded and is actually activated. So we see that. I've got my little Pop Warner logo, little nickname that I've earned being a football fan and my last name being Warner. And we've got two headers there, or two, uh, two header sections, our header 01 and header 02. And that's great. But what can we do with the actual properties? Well, what I'm going to do is we're going to, uh, we're going to include content by targeting it, right? So I've pre-created some weather, say a client comes in and they say, well, we want, we want some weather, uh, put into our, our, uh, header. Uh, and so we're going to go ahead and I'm going to remove it just using, uh, PowerShell again. And then I'm going to redeploy my custom action. What you'll notice, though, is that I'm now including a client-side property, and it says target header section 01. So what we're telling it to do, and I'll show you the code in a moment, is we're going to inject some hard-coded weather. Uh, of course, the implementation of that can be much more elegant and complex uh, for a real environment application. purpose here is to illustrate the use of properties. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and deploy deploy that custom action. You see it ran very, very fast and successfully. So now when I refresh, uh, we're going to see that it is sunny in Vesadelphia, right? It's always sunny in Vesadelphia. Uh, now, what does that look like in the actual code? We'll come down here. Here's our weather forecast. Very simple. I just got a simple uh, hard-coded uh, forecast div, right? And we just populate it. What I do is I look at the target string property, which is target, uh, and then I use that um, as my get class by cl or get element by class name. I set the inner HTML and I populate the weather HTML into that. So what that means is now I can make this dynamic. Uh, if we have a client or a business user come in and say, well, that's great, but I actually want it in the second one. Well, okay, great. Now let me go ahead and uh, recreate another extension or um, update the extension uh, and, and call it something else. But now uh, we can just simply change this to two, right? I'll go ahead and remove my custom action. Yes. And we'll redeploy it. Um, identifying that our target is now section 02. It's ran. I refresh. And now we see it's over here, much more sunny. Forecast is always sunny in Visadelphia, right? So uh, a simple implementation. Now, let's take that a step further. How can we actually, instead of just targeting the location of where our content is going to go, is it possible to make uh, the structure of our header a little more dynamic, right? So let's go back to our, our uh, let's go back to our developer Cameron. He gets another request. Uh, I saw what you did for client so and so. I'd love it, but I want three columns. Okay, well his smile's got a little bit less kick to it, right? And then he does that. So he creates another extension, and then he gets a request from another client or business user. I want four columns. Uh, now he's a little more sad because he's juggling multiple extensions, and then all of a sudden he gets five columns, and he's freaking out, right? So. Is there a way to solve that simple request by creating and using properties? And so, yes, what we're going to have over here, I've got another site set up, another extension has been installed, dynamic header. Uh, and so I'm going to go back to my PowerShell, uh, excuse me, PowerShell, and I'm going to connect to that site. And we're just going to go ahead and do the exact same thing. We're going to check to make sure we have no custom actions, and we don't, as we can see down there. Uh, nothing was output. And we're going to go ahead and deploy it at first with, with no properties. We're just going to show what it looks like as it is. So if I come here, refresh, uh, we're going to see the same general look and feel. We're going to see our logo there, and we're going to see just one column showing up. We see we've got our sections wrapper right down there. Uh, we've got our sections wrapper, uh, header sections wrapper, and of course we see the, the number generated by the SharePoint framework that makes it unique for the CSS and the SAS. Um, and so now we're going to look at how we can, how can we modify that? Well, we have a column count property. And what happens if I go over to the code, 
It's very simple, again, hard-coded. Um, we've got our column count property coming in, identified right up here as a property. And then what we do is we simply look as we're building our HTML, and this is just using basic, simple JavaScript. It can be used with any framework or library that you want to use to make the building of it easier. But for purposes of a simple demo, uh, we just come in, we look, we get our column count to see how many columns we want. Uh, and then we just do a simple loop, and we build the sections for our header based on the column count. So we start at one because we want our actual ID to start at one. Uh, we add one to our column count so we know the count is always accurate. Uh, we just loop through it, and then we output it to the dynamic HTML uh, into the inner HTML. So what that looks like once we've implemented it, uh, we'll go ahead and remove the existing one. We'll redeploy by including the column count. You can see there client-side uh, component properties, column count three. So if I go ahead and execute that, successful, I'll come back to... The browser will refresh, and we see we've got three columns, all responsive, right? They're set up, float left 33%, uh, and they're each showing up there for us to be able to, to utilize. Now, let's go ahead and change that. Let's remove <clears throat> our custom action, and let's go ahead and pass the column count property of five. And so we're just we're not changing the extension in any way, shape, or form. We're just simply creating new custom actions that point to that extension, passing properties. Come back, refresh, and now we see five. And they're still aware, right? So we've set up CSS that now says, oh, hey, look, uh, it's 20% because we've set up our CSS to know that there's a header count five. You can support up to as many as you want with the CSS. Just have the CSS there to um, support it. We see I've included a class here. Whoops. Close that. A class here that has the header section wrapper count five right there on the bottom. Uh, so it lets us know how many we have, and then we can apply the CSS to appropriately set the width of these so they still are truly responsive. Now, what if we wanted to go ahead and couple our first example and our second example? So, of course, what is something that we would likely see in our header uh, that would give a user comfort when they're experiencing a new website? Well, they may want to have uh, an email request uh, for support. So we'll go ahead and remove our current custom action, and we can see... What we've done is I now am coupling this new concept with the original concept, got column count five, uh, support content true, and I'll show what the code is behind that. Again, just a hard-coded uh, support email request link and support content header section 01. And so now we're going to go ahead and deploy that user cust or that custom action, and any SharePoint site would be devoid if it didn't include a support request that said, Dear Vesa, sharing is caring. Vesa at sharingiscaring.com, right? It's one that everybody needs. We all need links to Dear Vesa email support. And so how that looks, again, in the dynamic header is we have our support content, uh, and we're just simply, in this case, uh, we're getting the support content, uh, and we're, um, uh, we're getting the, the element class. In this case, I was hard coding the section 01, uh, and then we just... In, set the inner HTML for support and, um, and inject it there. So now you can see you've got a single extension. Again, a very simple implementation uh, of what we're doing here, but a powerful concept in that we can set up our extensions and during deployment uh, or provisioning of the site, whether it be a site design, site script, um, we can set our extensions, headers, or footers to do something unique uh, based on the properties assigned from the headers and footers. So that's the uh, that's what I have for the demo. That's really, really, really great. Except to the the rest I must fun. Now um, on the the few things to notice. So this is exactly what we explained like two weeks or four weeks ago. I can't remember when we talked about the things. And great to have a detailed demo walkthrough and the options on that one as well. Um, now did this, this, did you actually deploy the solution to the site, or was it a tenant scoped deployed option? Which one was it? I deployed it to the site. 
Yeah, so because obviously technically this would work uh, for deployment option where you have the SPFX solution deployed in a, only in app catalog and the tenant deployed option being true. Because um, as long as you create the user custom action with a, com a client side component ID associating to the manifest ID, the extension will just light up. Um, again, there's there's multiple options and designs uh, to take, uh, and that brings flexibility for the for the customers and partners. But uh, David, on your side, just out of curiosity, uh, we still have like five minutes, and we can do Q and A on that one. Um, how does it feel the SPFX extension uh, from a let's say extensibility perspective? The design, uh, can you achieve your typical header footer uh, capabilities with it? Uh, what's the feeling on that side? Um, yeah, I mean, like when you start thinking creatively, like this is right—a very simple implementation, but a creative thought process here in saying how can we take one extension and use it in many ways. I think that that's fantastic. The one thing that I actually was getting ready to put a user voice request in for is maybe a configurable property where the um, composite header, where we have the little uh, square logo and navigation yep. and site name, being able to hide that <clears throat> because our headers are usually going to include some degree of logo, uh, right? A, a, maybe a collection of content, whether it be a weather, stock, alert, something like that. And then likely another custom navigation that may be responsive, mega menu, whatever. Um, but then it starts looking redundant, right? So I would say that to me, that, that to make the extensions really powerful and be able to really control the look and feel, I know we're not supposed to override, right? We can include CSS that can hide that composite header, yeah. um, but that's getting outside the boundaries of playing the game by the rules. Yes. <laughs> yes. So if if um, and I don't think there's a user voice request for that. Uh, uh, so I, let I me think know. There's a user voice request. So and this is this, but this is a classic scenario when what people are asking quite often. So absolutely understandable scenario. It is also internally in, in SharePoint engineering. This is kind of a classic debate as well. How much flexibility we do do we actually want to provide? Um, or do we just have a certain set of flexibility uh, because then um, it's more safe and it will reduce the support costs and all of that. So it is interesting discussion even in generally uh, how much of this stuff should we enable and how much we shouldn't. Um, obviously, if there's a user voice entry uh, entered and that will getting a lot of votes, absolutely people will start uh, prioritizing those uh, changes in the future. That's why we always ask user voice entries. Um, yeah, which, okay, I'll set one up. Excellent, excellent. Which reminded me on earlier today, I just went through uh, the whole user voice entries for SharePoint Dev, and that should be now pretty clean. So there's uh, no kind of a uh, crap on that side, and, and all of the unnecessary things should be uh, clean, so, or deleted, or closed, or whatever. Um, but um, getting more items there, getting your input there, super valuable uh, for new feature requirements. Now, if you, again, if you find out that there's an issue in API, SPFX doesn't work, you run into random unexpected situation, then the issue list in SP DevDocs uh, is an option. If your issue actually is a new feature request, we will then tell you that it is a new feature request and you can go to the user voice. But in this case, uh, having a support, for example, for uh, removing the whole header section in the pages, that's clearly a new feature. That's not a bug. That's not an issue as such that uh, it's a new feature. Um, we are also looking into, for example, having additional placeholders. Now, what they will be, um, that will be announced in SPC. So the SPC SharePoint conference uh, in Las Vegas is our spring moment. So in the past, for past two years, uh, we've been having this virtual May uh, event for SharePoint, where we always announce the latest and greatest and stuff which we are working on. Um, that doesn't happen this year because we have SharePoint conference in Las Vegas. So the Las Vegas is really the moment where we go through and explain, hey, here's the new placeholders. Hey, here's the new goodies for SharePoint framework development. Hey, here's this stuff. Uh, will we ship it on SPC? That's a different discussion. Some stuff will be enabled immediately in SPC. Some stuff will be shipped by Ignite because Ignite is our autumn uh, timeframe event. Good. Uh, on the placeholders, as an example, classic uh, thing, but what uh, people are asking, and it is uh, kind of a frustrating that it's not yet there, is the footer, and the footer is floating. Uh, so if you scroll down, for example, if you have a long page, the footer is all the time visible on a page. So the footer is not inside of the page, it's not 
in the content. Uh, that's something what we're looking into having. And again, I can't promise you that it will be there at this point because I can't announce these things obviously in the community course, but that is one of the things uh, what we're looking into making happen potentially by uh, SPC. Uh, and there's a lot of other stuff. I, I think people will be, I think we can surprise even people uh, in SPC. So there's cool stuff on the pipeline. I think a lot of the MVPs were super excited on the MVP summit because they got some level of an insights uh, what will be happening. Um, good. Uh, AC is super excited on the SPC as well. As well. Now, AC, you have a. Uh, Yes, there's, there it is. Thank you. Uh, make uh, your voice heard on the SharePoint development. So there's the uh, uh, state of SharePoint uh, development.com uh, link. So please go there, answer that form. We in SharePoint engineering even are going to use those results to understand how the community is customizing stuff. This is a survey run by Voitanos, so AC's company, and Rencore. Uh, Rencore uh, is, uh, well, plenty of people working there as well. But we will absolutely take advantage of the insights which we get out of that survey as well. So please go and, and fill that out. So absolutely fine. <laughs> how, how many times can I end that survey? I don't know. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, anybody using SharePoint mobile app? Um, that's interesting question. I'm not using that. Well, we are using that quite technically, not super, super much. Uh, SPFX should be working natively there as well. Uh, good. Just quickly checking the questions. I think we're hitting tower, by the way, Patrick. I think it's. Sorry, I think we should be closing. Isn't that the case? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, one more yeah. thing. One more thing. Um, <laughs> So thanks, everybody. Uh, our next uh, instance of this call is going to be April 26th for the SPFX JS uh, Special Interest Group. Our next general dev special interest group is next Thursday, April 19th, uh, same time. And uh, look forward to talking with folks on both of those calls. Thank you, everybody, for joining the call today. And look forward to talking with you out there on the various channels. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.